So Barry is running along the shore of a lake as fast as possible. He knows that if he stops, his life will turn into a nightmare in no time. A thousand mosquitoes are about to bite him. But what he doesn't know is that he'll be okay after all. So don't be afraid, Barry, and stop. Mosquitoes are slow. They fly at a little more than one mile per hour. (laughs) And you can't run forever. So after a couple of hours of pointless running, Barry stops. He sweats and emits a smell attractive to insects. One little mosquito flies up to him. It buzzes next to his ear, sits on his sweaty neck, and bites. The insect pierces the skin with a special mouth apparatus called a proboscis. The mosquito starts pumping blood through this needle. Its saliva gets into Barry's body and causes an allergic reaction. More precisely, it's Barry's immune system that starts this reaction. It perceives the mosquito's saliva as an enemy and sends a unique chemical substance to the bite site. The fight between this substance and the invader causes an allergic reaction. Redness, swelling, and the worst thing, itching. Barry can scratch himself for several hours or even days. It all depends on how his body will react to the bite. The mosquito fills up with Barry's blood and flies away. It does it not for pleasure, but because it needs to lay eggs. Protein in the blood is necessary for these insects to reproduce. Their eggs can't grow without this substance. Yeah, almost all biting mosquitoes are female. Male mosquitoes prefer plant and flower nectar. Hey, they're guys. So the female mosquito flies away from Barry. She sits down on the shore of the lake, where a large mosquito base is located. Here, these insects lay eggs, drink water, and chill in the sun. There are several hundred thousand of them, and they're all hungry. The female mosquito brings with her the smell of berry sweat, which is attractive to the rest of the mosquitoes, too. There are about 3,500 species of these insects on Earth. Some of them love the smell of sugar, perfume, or deodorant. And some enjoy the smell of dirty feet. Mm. Now, your attractiveness to mosquitoes also depends on what you have eaten today. Lots of candies and chocolate? Great! Now, mosquitoes feel a faint sweet smell coming from you. Have you eaten garlic and onions? Mosquitoes probably won't want to deal with you. And not only they, most likely. (laughs) So, the smell of berry sweat is perfect for all mosquitoes on the shore. They go mad, take off, and head for the poor guy. If you walk near the water when the evening comes, if you're sweaty, wearing black clothes, and have O-type blood, then you have all the chances to get bitten by mosquitoes. And Barry meets all the criteria. The first mosquitoes land on Barry's feet. They bite him and start pumping blood. One tiny mosquito can draw a droplet of blood the size of a half a grain of rice. It's nothing at all. But several dozen of these bites? It's bad. Barry fights mosquitoes off with his hands, but the insects keep coming. They can't miss such a delicious dinner. 10, 20, 50, 100 mosquitoes. They cover Barry's legs. The skin swells and turns red. Barry feels a burning sensation. His immune system is working at 100%, trying to reduce the damage and drive the enemies away. But the more actively Barry's body defenses work, the worse he feels. Mosquitoes sit on his hands and on his wet t-shirt stuck to his body. Yes, their mouthpiece can pierce a thin layer of fabric. Barry tries to run away. He stumbles over a rock and falls. Some insects finish their feast and fly away to tell their friends about the free food. Mosquitoes from all over the lake come to try Barry. 200 mosquitoes are drinking his blood. Three, five, seven, nine hundred. Now, one thousand mosquitoes have bitten him. Together, they have pumped out a small glass of blood. But the worst thing is, they continue biting him. Nothing can stop them now, even though they were supposed to bite him only a thousand times. Well, the only chance to escape is water. Barry, ignoring the itch, gets up and runs to the shore of the lake. Meanwhile, one hundred thousand mosquitoes have already bitten him. Sorry, Barry, but we have to entertain the audience. Don't worry, your recovery will be fast. He's getting closer and closer to the water. Mosquitoes are flying in front of his face, so he can't see the road. But Barry keeps running, waving his hands. Meanwhile, 
You know this moment when you're sleeping and one mosquito flies into the room through the window? Just one. But its squeaky Hmm. sound is so annoying. And now, imagine a million mosquitoes making this noise. It's like a saxophone playing high notes. Sorry if you're a sax player. Well, Barry is slowing down. He's exhausted, and his heart is beating too fast. He no longer feels bites and itches. His body is becoming weak, but he's still moving toward the lake. Mosquitoes have already taken three soda cans of blood from him. And this is serious. Barry is running a fever and has clouded consciousness. His immune system is not coping. Barry can't run anymore. He's struggling to walk. It's getting harder to make every next step. The shore is only a few feet away, but it doesn't matter anymore since he has no energy to move. So he just sits on the grass and accepts the situation. He's lost a large soda bottle of blood, and this is a lot. This is probably the most large-scale attack of mosquitoes on humans. And then, at the very last moment, salvation appears. A frog croaks nearby, and another one. Several dozen jumping animals are approaching the shore. They release their tongues like spears and catch mosquitoes. This gives Barry hope. He makes a last-ditch effort to reach the lake. He jumps in. Yeah! What a relief! Cold, fresh water envelops his whole body and relieves the itching and irritation from the bites. He waits in the water while the frogs dine on the mosquitoes. The remaining insects fly away. Barry crawls out of the lake. He sees frogs catching mosquitoes and realizes that these annoying insects are necessary for our planet. Frogs live thanks to these tiny monsters. And besides frogs, there are many other animals that feed on mosquitoes. Lizards, spiders, bats, birds, turtles, it's a huge list. Mosquitoes are an endless source of food for them. One pair can lay 200 eggs. They grow fast and their lives are short. But if all these insects disappear, An ecological catastrophe may begin. Entire animal species may vanish from the face of the Earth. The frogs that save Barry wouldn't exist. Without frogs, the population of other insects, like flies, would begin to grow. They would reproduce uncontrollably. And then, like falling dominoes, other problems will follow. So, Barry, don't be angry at mosquitoes. It's just nature. You better deal with your itchy problem. His whole body is red, covered with little bumps. He starts scratching himself, but this doesn't help. He only makes it worse. As long as mosquito saliva remains in his body and the immune system fights it, Barry will feel this itch. Fortunately, there are many oils and ointments to alleviate these effects. But the best way to get rid of the problem is to ignore it. Barry just needs to distract himself with something. Then the urge to scratch will disappear. Barry has survived so many mosquito bites without harmful consequences. But some people have problems dealing with just one. It depends on whether a person has allergies. Some have a small itchy bump, and others have severe inflammation. As for Barry, wasn't he swell? I mean, didn't he swell? (laughs) Okay, I'll stop. The best way to protect yourself is to use insect spray. Now, Barry sprays himself with this substance before every run and feels safe. But let's have a look at another situation. What if Barry gets attacked by huge dogs? Hey, just kidding. Relax, Barry. You wake up with pizza boxes piled up on top of each other. You stretch your right arm and slide it across some wet spilled noodles you had last night. Your leg smears some chocolate cake from last week and stains your mattress. There are random papers, clothes, books, food cartons with food still inside them, and other random useless junk all over your queen-size bed. You're too lazy to get out of bed, but you have to get to work. You shove aside all the junk and slide it onto the already littered ground. There are plastic bottles, more fast food litter, clothes, dirty dishes, and animal fur on the ground. It's sticky and covers every inch of real estate to the point that you feel like you're walking on lava. You stare out the dirty window, look at yourself in the mirror, and sulk. This isn't the you you'd thought you'd be a year ago. 
The sun is shining and you just bought your brand new house. It's a nice place outside the city in a little friendly neighborhood surrounded by picket fences and blooming flowers. Your neighbors come up to greet you just as you pull in the driveway. They bring a casserole and some yummy desserts to welcome you to the neighborhood. You gleefully accept them and head inside your new pad. Throughout the week, you unpack your bags and arrange your furniture. You also just landed a new job, which helped you afford this house. You wake up every day at 6 a.m. and come back home at 10 p.m. This new job is paying you well, but you don't have time for yourself or to keep your house in order. Over the next few months, you start ordering food every night and bringing leftovers to work. You haven't changed your bed sheet since you arrived and haven't vacuumed the floor since you first stepped foot inside. The smell inside is getting stronger, considering you're not taking out the trash or opening the windows to air out the house. You've also given up on sorting out your dirty laundry. You have no more clean clothes left, so you're reusing the same clothes for work, but they have food stains all over them. The bathrooms are not a place anyone would like to go. The running water drips and overflows onto the floor, making it damp inside. Since no sunlight enters, mold grows abundantly, providing a home for various bacteria and parasites. It's no wonder you call in sick every month. So much work has made you lose sight of your house and has affected your performance at work. You've gotten multiple warnings and have been told to take care of yourself and get new clothes or wash the ones you have. But the more clothes you buy, the more dirty stacks of clothes appear all over your house. There's no place to sleep anymore. Your bed is a mountain of junk, and your couch is home to boxes you haven't even unpacked since you moved in. You order a sleeping bag and crash in the dirty kitchen. Cockroaches are crawling on every inch of the kitchen floor counter, and little crawl spaces. Rats have chewed on most of the wooden furniture and created a network of underground tunnels for them to access every area of your house. You hear the little rat tails clacking on the tiles whenever they run past your ear. You try to sleep, but the dishes in the sink are so stacked up that the dripping faucet channels water to run through the plates and glasses and splash on your forehead. You pick up your sleeping bag and place it in the basement. The smell is unbearable. There is moss growing in every corner and even a small puddle of stagnant water festering and providing a home for mosquitoes, bacteria, and other vermin. The rats and mice use this small pool as a swimming ground to have pool parties and clean themselves up after a long day of eating your food and creating tunnels. There are thousands of rats in every corner, but you somehow don't mind them anymore. You see little nests of baby rats in the dark corners. The wooden foundation is failing and being eaten away by termites and the buildup of mold. You wake the next day with rat footprints all over your body and go to work only to be kicked out and sent back home to clean yourself up. You try to shower, but the pipes are clogged and only a few drops of dirty water land on your body. You go to the backyard that has a dirt-filled patch where you were supposed to build a swimming pool, but didn't have time to follow up on it. You lay your sleeping bag on the dirt and try to find a garden hose to clean yourself. But rats have gnawed through the plastic, so it can't spray properly. Either way, you rinse yourself with water and try to dry yourself with some garbage bags since you can't find your towels in the sea of trash. You go back inside to watch TV, which surprisingly still works. You clear some space on your couch and order pizza. You have a stack of pizza boxes stacked on top of each other, forming a makeshift coffee table, and you rest your legs on it. The pressure and weight of your legs allow some insects to scurry away that have been eating the leftover crusts and cheese. The doorbell rings and you get up and answer it. 
the delivery guy is already in his car driving away from the stench. They all know you by now. It's a good thing you paid online. You go back to watching the movie while seeing some more critters crawling all over your TV set. Hours pass, and you realize that you need to wake up early for work. You make some room to sleep, but scratch your head on some sharp object lying around the couch. Months pass. The neighbors stop talking to you, and even straight up ignore you. They avoid you every time you leave your house. Mostly, they gossip and comment on your house. All the pests that came from your house are spreading throughout the neighborhood. Pest control cars are driving in and out of the neighborhood, visiting a new house every day. Flies and maggots have settled your house to the point that it's impossible to walk around and not have some flies circling your face. Anyone who drives by the neighborhood knows that your house is the source of the infestation. Many more months pass, and your house is unrecognizable. It's impossible to see the floor, and the walls have scratches all over them. Rats have taken over and nibbled on just about everything. They've become your new friends when eating and even finished some leftovers for you. The basement is completely flooded, and the water is leaking out to the main road. Other creatures have sought shelter in your home, including stray cats and dogs, raccoons, possums, and even bats. You have broken glass all over the floor from the busted light bulbs, and your mattress has holes all over it. You wake up with pizza boxes stacked all over you, and then look at the mirror. It's your one-year anniversary of moving in, and this isn't the life you imagined. Out the window, you see your neighbors selling their homes, with some already gone, including the one who welcomed you when you first moved in. You turn around and, as if for the first time, you finally see that your house is such a mess. You spot a picture of yourself hanging on the wall. You put it there when you first moved in. You decide to fix your house and clean it all up. You know it'll take weeks or months, but you skip work and begin by cleaning up your room. You get boxes of garbage bags and start stuffing trash inside. You buy three new vacuum cleaners and start collecting all the dust and debris that has collected over the past year. After a couple of hours, you have over 20 garbage bags outside your house waiting to be collected. The stains will need to be scrubbed away, and the destroyed furniture will need to be thrown out. After two months of hard work, you manage to get rid of all the trash you can find. It takes you another week to scrub the floors and walls and order new furniture to replace the broken, chewed-up ones. The biggest challenge is getting rid of the remaining pests and fixing the basement water problem. After making some phone calls, you get some pros to fix the water and get rid of the vermin. It takes you a total of 4 months to turn your place into a minty fresh pad to live in. Your garden is blooming, and you go back to work in fresh clothes with a wide smile. And you get to meet your new neighbors, who have heard all about you. Yep, you have some fences to mend, don't you? You are waiting for your garlic bread in the oven. While looking up at the stars through your kitchen window, you ask yourself, could you send garlic bread to space? And more importantly, could you still eat it if it came back? (laughs) Some mighty important questions. Usually, when it comes to garlic bread, there are only two things people care about. Do we want cheese on it? And, oh yeah, eating it. That mouth-watering, garlicky taste combined with the soft, warm bread. Okay, focus. How are we going to send the bread to space? Given that NASA's first space shuttle cost roughly $49 billion, I don't think they'll allow us to borrow a rocket ship for the day, since they may have, you know, more important things to do. I know, it's hard to believe that some people don't take garlic bread as seriously as the rest of us. Don't worry, though. All we need is a balloon. Not the kind of balloon we're used to being around at things like parties, where you're surrounded by pizza, burgers and bread buns, hot dogs and bread buns, and cake. I think bread might have too strong of a hold on me. Anyway, the kind of balloon we need is a weather balloon. A weather balloon is explicitly designed to reach high altitudes of up to 24 miles. 
It carries instruments beyond our atmosphere to send information on temperature, humidity, wind speed, and atmospheric pressure back to us. A French meteorologist, this guy, first started experimenting with them in 1896, and his work led to the discovery of the stratosphere. Hmm, I wonder if he'd been proud of these balloons now operating as an extraterrestrial taxi service for our garlic bread. Maybe not, but I'm sure he'd be delighted knowing that hundreds of people worldwide today release these balloons for their own experiments every 12 hours. Most standard organizations believe that space officially starts at the completely arbitrated Kármán line, over 62 miles above us. Sending the bread into orbit would require a speed of tens of thousands of miles an hour. Without our rocket ship, which conventionally travels at a speed of 17,000 miles per hour, we won't be able to get the bread that high or to travel at that speed. Okay, no, you can still keep the rocket. I'm happy with my amazing weather balloon, which, by the way, will still get us a third of the way to space, bringing us to the area known as the edge of space. Mm. Given that the atmosphere up there is so thin, about 1% of the pressure at ground level, it's really not that bad of a substitute for actual space for this test. I was never comfortable with being over 62 miles away from my dinner anyway. So this works much better for my food abandonment issues. Oh, my ears! I can already hear you at your computer screaming, what is this guy talking about? I've seen videos of things like pizza being sent to actual space before using a similar method. Why should we settle for the edge of space? Well, many cameras operating in those videos to document the object's journey use a fisheye lens. This lens exaggerates the Earth's curve compared to what it looks like at those heights, giving off the illusion that the camera is closer to space than it is. (laughs) Glad we settled that. Unlike if I were to ask you which is better, pizza or garlic bread. Moving swiftly along, thank you. Now that we've got our weather balloon to which we've reluctantly attached our garlic bread, The moment for takeoff has arrived. We launch the garlic bread to the sky and wipe the tears from our cheeks as we watch it disappear beyond the clouds. In comparison to a rocket, the pace of our balloon may as well be that of a tortoise, and it will travel at a speed of over 1,000 feet per minute. So, a good way to distract ourselves from the sadness of our bread's departure is by asking ourselves what the garlic bread's in store for during its journey. Well, in two hours, our weather balloon can rise above the clouds higher than the paths of jet planes, passing through the ozone layer in the stratosphere and reaching altitudes of 22 miles or higher. The balloon will endure temperatures as cold as minus 90 degrees centigrade, meaning we'd better have a microwave on hand should it make its way back to us. The balloon will expand as it ascends, from 6.5 feet up to 26 feet, because air pressure decreases as the balloon climbs higher in the atmosphere. What happens next would be a truly satisfying experience were my food not being put at risk as a result. Our weather balloon pops. And just like that, our garlic bread will begin the descent from the skies. Wind conditions dictate how far from the launch site the bread will land, but we can expect it to turn up no more than 75 miles away. As is the case for experiments with weather balloons, a parachute is attached to the cargo, which will help ensure the bread's safe return and a reunion with its best friend, my stomach. Some say it's a one-sided friendship. Even though it's this stomach of mine that's currently making animal noises from starvation, it's actual animals who now pose a threat as potential predators of snatching our dinner. Engineers have designed packaging for exercises like this, equipped with GPS and a servo. This packaging will close shut approximately 3,280 feet above the ground. It will protect the garlic bread from unwanted landing spots and the various jaws of the animal kingdom, dramatically increasing the likelihood of being able to eat the garlic bread if we can relocate it. In all actuality, weather balloons used for experiments like this are doing more damage to wildlife and nature than vice versa. Marine animals like turtles often mistake the remains of weather balloons in the water for jellyfish and eat them, thinking that they've just got themselves an easy meal. This is damaging for these animals, given the components of these weather balloons contain rubber and battery acid. Arguments have been put forth that weather balloon testing is ultimately another form of littering. 
If this video inspires you to try and send some food to space using balloons, keep this in mind. So, the hunt is now on. Not for any wild animals, but ourselves. What's that saying, though? Fail to prepare. Prepare to go without that fantastic piece of garlic bread that you've just launched into the edge of space, which you're now on your way to reclaim? Or is it just preparing to fail? It doesn't matter, as suggested by the parachute and protective packaging. We're doing neither. To ensure we could find the bread once it landed, we attach radio trackers to the balloon before launching it. These send a signal with a GPS position to the ground, which is then put on a map for us to chase, giving us a good idea of where the garlic bread will be found. Man, I love technology! And just like that, the moment has arrived! we found our garlic bread intact! And after some moments of passionate hugging and loving strokes, I'm ready to take a bite. So, was the weight worth it? How's it taste? And can you eat it? Yes, you can. But the taste? Mm, not that great, actually. And despite mentioning it earlier, I forgot to bring my microwave. The bread's been frozen from the frightening temperatures experienced on its journey. And I actually mean frozen. The bread itself has an icy middle. But before we can even discover this, we'll notice that when we go to rip a piece of the bread off, it doesn't tear as normal. Instead, it snaps off, as if we've just broken a piece off a twig. We can even hear the clicking noise. My warm, soft bread is no more. You'd be better off keeping this for dessert in the event you run out of frozen ice cream. On second thought, let's just throw it in the trash. Nonetheless, it's pretty cool that we were able to send this garlic bread to the edge of space and still end up eating it, right? Before I pass out from starvation, I'm going to the store to buy some more, which I definitely won't be sending to space. Why don't you let us know in the comments if there's any food you'd like to send to space for seasoning before eating. It's dark, and you can't see anything. There's slime all over. The ground is soft and moving. You try to find your way around by feeling the moving walls around you. After a while, you hear some painful screams in the distance. You call out for help, but no one responds. You're a captain of a ship, and you are just consumed by the mighty Kraken! You keep tumbling over, not knowing if you're even going in the right direction. The screams get louder and louder. It's only a matter of time before you see someone. As you make your next step, a large piece of wood swooshes past you, almost knocking you down. That piece of wood was from the ship that the Kraken had swallowed. It had also swallowed the entire crew alive, so they must be somewhere inside the beast's belly. You keep following the screams. They lead you down another path that looks like an esophagus. You grab a piece of wood and slide down the slimy insides. It's dark, so you rip out a piece of cloth from your shirt and wrap it around a large plank, setting it on fire. This makeshift torch allows you to see where you're going in proper detail. You can see the large veins pumping inside. Each vein can fit more than three people through it. After a while, you start seeing more debris from your ship, including the treasures you had discovered and kept in the bottom. But now, those huge piles of gold are worthless since you're out looking for your crewmates in this dark, smelly interior. You reach a point where there seems to be multiple tunnels around, each leading to a different point. You know it's impossible to climb back out from the mouth, so going deeper is the only solution. You decide to go with your gut and slide down the smallest tunnel, which is covered in slime and other liquids. You snuff out your torch and tuck it away to use it again later. You slip through and get stuck for a while. The Kraken is still swimming, but seems to be taking a break and stops. The giant veins and blood vessels slow down, and the flesh tunnel that you're crawling through becomes wider. Before you know it, you are plummeting down the large shaft until you reach a liquid pool. The second you splash in it, you start to feel the acid burning through your clothes. You're in one of the Kraken's stomachs. You take off your shirt and paddle on a plank, rowing yourself across the acidic lake. You can see more broken pieces of your ship scattered around. Out of nowhere, the Kraken springs into action and starts swimming rapidly. You don't have a choice but to hold on to the plank and keep yourself afloat without any acid going into your eyes. You shut them. 
Now, you're tossed further down the stomach, where the digestion is happening. Over here, the acid is even stronger and melts anything that's in it. The smell is atrocious, and you can't find your way to leave. But in the distance, you see some of your crew members stranded in the middle of a small stomach island. You see some sharks still swimming around that haven't been digested yet. There's nothing you can do at the moment but try to get through and make it to your crew members. You get on another piece of wood and row yourself toward them. This time, the stomach acid is melting the wood away. Luckily, someone from your crew tosses you another plank, so you hop onto it and row your way to them. You climb ashore. Everyone is happy to see you. You try to figure out a way out, but the exits are covered in acid. More water seeps in along with plenty of marine animals. The acid levels are rising, and everyone huddles together. After a while, the kraken swallows a large humpback whale that's thrashing around the acidic water. It's making the kraken upset, so it starts moving, tossing everyone around. You, along with many others, land on the whale and hold onto it tight. It seems like the kraken wants to expunge the whale out somehow. The inner walls of the stomach contract until it shrinks enough to let the whale out. You and your crew members are still holding onto the whale, but it's not easy. Finally, the kraken spits out the whale and swims off to the bottom of the ocean. The new challenge is to swim to the surface to breathe. The whale pushes you and everyone else up. Without it, no one would have made it to the surface to catch some oxygen. You don't know where you are. Some of your crewmates grab onto some loose pieces of your ship to stay afloat. You swim to one and climb aboard. The sun is starting to set. There's nothing in sight. The crew is feeling cold and hungry. Worst of all, it's feeding time for the sharks. Everyone climbs up on their planks to stay out of the water. Before you know it, shark fins start to pop up from every corner. There's nothing to do except survive the night. The next day arrives. No one has managed to get any sleep. Everyone decides to fix all the planks together and row towards the sun. While other people debate another direction, the whole crew listens to your final word. The sun is scorching and everyone's energy is low. There's no fresh water to drink. No one can catch fish for eating. There's still the ever-looming threat of sharks and the kraken. One of your crew members spots something in the distance, which appears to be an island. Everyone cheers and hugs each other and paddles their way there. After a few hours, you reach the island and stuff your hands in the sand. Someone is running around while others embrace the sand and palm trees. But for some reason, something seems off. Some birds are flying around. They aren't scared of you. Everyone moves to the center of the island to discover if anyone has been here before. A small campfire sits in the middle of the island, but there are no signs of people anywhere. This island's too small to have any residents. There seems to be no sign of anyone who has ever visited it, besides the campfire. After a while, the island starts moving. Everyone climbs a tree and water covers the island. In the distance, you see a large figure emerge from the water and turn towards you. It's a giant sea turtle. You were on the back of a giant sea turtle this whole time. It moves gracefully across the water and stops after a couple of hours. The crew members build some huts and start a fire to cook some food and sleep comfortably. You look out in the distance and at the night sky with the stars populating the horizon. You climb the highest tree to get some rest and peace. Far away, you see the kraken swimming around and getting closer to the turtle. But compared to it, the kraken is only the size of a shoe compared to a person. The next day, you tread around and discover the rest of the Turtleback Island. Some unique animals you've never seen before are living here. Some of the most exotic birds are flying around, and the animals don't seem to take you as a threat. You reach the top of the mountain covered with trees and vines to get a good look at the island. You have a panoramic view of everything and discover that there's a huge hole in the ground right below you. And you see what appears to be digging tools left by other explorers. You gather your crew and rush to the hole. You have to make your way through vines and climb over some challenging terrain to reach there. The main question is, where does this hole go if the bottom of this island is a giant turtle shell? 
You step on the site and see many abandoned tools and plans. You pick up a map and see that there is an X marking for treasures beyond anyone's imagination. You gather your crew. Everyone picks up some of the equipment. Another scary question is, why did they abandon this equipment? You study the plans. They state all the steps, except the final one, which no one seems to have figured out. After a while, you descend the hole and make your way towards the bottom. But what you discover is even more shocking than what you expected. And you'll have to find out what it is next. Among all the planets of the solar system, our Earth is unique, since it's the only one that has developed life. But what if we got a competitor? What if a second Earth appeared out of nowhere? Then there would be two different scenarios. The first is the destruction of both planets. And the second has an unexpected but pretty logical ending. But let's start with the catastrophic scenario. The second Earth with the same conditions could only exist if it received absolutely the same amount of sunlight as our planet. The orbit that our Earth follows is perfect for getting the necessary amount of solar heat. If we were a little further away, the entire surface of our planet would resemble Antarctica. And if Earth were a little closer to the sun, we'd all live in a huge desert inhabited by very few living beings. So. For the second Earth to be identical to ours, it would need to follow the orbit of our planet. Two massive objects can exist close to each other. The union of Earth and the Moon is a great example. But if the second object was as heavy and huge as our planet, there wouldn't be enough space for both of them. The gravity of two Earths would be a huge problem. The two worlds would collide because they would be pulled toward each other. This process would last for hundreds of millions of years. And in the end, the two planets would transform into one giant world. And their remnants would be flying around the newly formed planet, resembling the rings around Saturn. Or one of the planets would push the other out of its orbit. In this case, one of the Earths would hurtle toward the sun and burn like a match in its atmosphere. It's also important to remember that Earth is moving at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour at all times. This is more than 80 times faster than the speed of sound. And now, imagine two huge planets that are flying toward each other at such a speed. Even a microscopic organism living in the mouth of a volcano wouldn't stand a chance to survive the collision of two Earths. Even the moon would be torn to pieces by the blast wave. But let's imagine that Earth's twin is following another orbit somewhere between Mars and Earth. Even in this situation, people's lives would change forever. By the way, the theory that Earth might have a twin appeared long ago. Scientists of the past believed that the second planet could be hiding on the opposite side of the Sun. Thanks to modern technologies and astronomy, we know this theory isn't true. Otherwise, our telescopes and other equipment would have already caught some signals from this planet. Scientists study space objects thousands of light years away from us, so they would definitely notice another world in the neighborhood. But anyway, let's imagine that the second Earth does exist, and we've discovered it recently. The entire field of astronomy and astrophysics will immediately receive hundreds of billions of dollars in funding. The study of Earth's twin will become a priority goal for people. Experts will put forward hundreds of hypotheses about what the second Earth looks like and what's happening there. The planet is almost at the same distance from the sun as we are. This means the weather must be the same there. Soon, scientists find out that Earth's doppelganger has liquid water and continents. But they aren't like ours. Their shapes and location are different. Most likely, life exists there too. But what is its origin? There's a hypothesis that life on our planet appeared thanks to amino acids brought here by a meteorite. It's highly improbable that the same thing happened to another world. Life most likely emerged there in a completely different way. Perhaps the fish didn't get out of the water on that planet, and the first intelligent creatures appeared in the ocean. These could be amphibians with scales and fins, or octopus-like monsters with huge tentacles. Fish on the second Earth could have come out of the water and grown limbs. But what if they didn't like walking on the ground? Then, this world might be inhabited by intelligent bird people. Or, life could have originated deep in the soil. Then evolution would create humanoid moles or highly developed worms. To find out for sure, scientists send a rover there. 
A similar mission to Mars was a success, so there shouldn't be any problems with this one. People on Earth are waiting. What will the rover find on the other side? It will take several years for the ship to get there. Strangely, two days after the launch, it returns. But wait, this is not our space probe! All this time, the inhabitants of the second Earth have been watching our planet too. At one point, they also sent a probe. It's made of the same materials as ours. It has a camera and a recording device. But people are worried because the rover looks similar to a mechanical spider. Can it be that giant tarantulas live in that world? Scientists understand that we need to communicate. We send our guests a radio signal with some information about our civilization. They catch this message and send their own. It contains strange symbols that resemble scratches. Linguists all over the world are trying to decipher it. Meanwhile, astronomers send the guests a recording of human speech. A few days later, our satellites catch a message from our space neighbors with their voices. Scientists are about to play the recording. The whole world is listening with bated breath. And it's a growl. A terrible, an absolutely incomprehensible growl. It has pauses and an unusual rhythm, but it's nothing resembling human speech. The whole planet is panicking. All countries are preparing for an invasion. The most important thing now is to build shields to protect the planet. No one can decrypt the message. It's possible that our neighbors can't understand us either. People make a last attempt to establish some contact. We send a video to explain to our guests with the help of gestures and signs that we only want peace and collaboration. The answer doesn't take long to wait. Our satellite receives their video file. Scientists play back the recording, and it's shocking! We see dinosaurs in robotic suits! Life on the second Earth has been developing in the same way as on our planet. But the infamous colossal meteorite didn't fall there. Over millions of years of evolution, dinosaurs have become sentient. In the video, they're growling and pointing with their claws at the picture of our Earth. Then they start growling even more loudly, and is it laughter? The recording ends. People consider this the announcement of the invasion. Several years have passed. During this time, scientists have exchanged messages with dinosaurs several times, and it seems we're beginning to understand them. It turns out that the reptiles also want peace. They say that their planet was once inhabited by humanoids similar to humans, but a massive flood wiped them away. Dinosaurs managed to survive and evolve into intelligent beings. It will take many years before people set foot on their planet. And when this happens, humanity will feel relieved, realizing that we're not alone. But what if there was no intelligent life on the second Earth? People would also be happy. We would know that we'd always have another home. Perhaps we'd start exploring Earth's twin right away, or begin mining its resources to replenish ours. In any case, our lives wouldn't change immediately, because that land would be too far away from our planet. Dozens of generations would pass before people begin settling on the second Earth. Our homeland planet would be losing more and more resources, so everyone would want to move to a new world. In the beginning, only the richest would be able to do it. But with time, space travel would become cheaper. People would probably invest a lot of money to build a paradise on the second Earth. If this happened, we'd be visiting this world during our vacation to breathe fresh air and enjoy nature. In any case, the human population would grow. This means that sooner or later, the second Earth would become as loaded as the first one. And then people would start searching for a new home among the stars. By the way, if any life exists on a planet similar to ours, it's likely to look like octopuses. There's even a theory that octopuses came to Earth from some other world. Any animal has several evolutionary stages of development. For example, elephants and mammoths descended from one common ancestor five to six million years ago. Looking even further, almost all mammals evolved from one ancestor they shared with reptiles. Each species has been changing over millions of years. But not octopuses. They suddenly appeared on a family tree. From the point of view of evolution, squids would have to evolve into octopuses millions of years from now. But look, they're already here. Besides, octopuses are incredibly smart. Their genetic code is much more diverse than the human one. They may be visitors from another planet that is similar to ours. But of course, 
This is only a hypothesis. Oh no! You swallowed something that shouldn't be in your mouth or end up in your stomach. And you heard some buzzing around you before opening your mouth to take a casual sip of juice. It wasn't a wasp, although it looks similar. It's some bigger relative of a wasp, that's for sure. Hornets are up to 2.2 inches long. Not easy to swallow, but still possible. They've got two wings, antennae, six legs, and big dark eyes. They're multicolored, but the majority of hornets have black and brownish red bodies with yellow or white stripes. Hornets are part of the wasp family, but bigger and wider than a common wasp. Just like their cousins, they have a pointy stinger at the end of their body, smooth enough so it doesn't fall out after stinging. It's linked to a gland where the venom is. Males tend to be aggressive toward intruders, but only female hornets will actually sting you. It's definitely more uncomfortable when a hornet stings you than when a wasp does. A hornet sting gives out less venom than a bee sting, but you'll feel it more when a hornet stings you because its venom contains more of a chemical, acetylcholine, which is the reason for discomfort. A hornet probably approached you because it was a nice sunny day, perfect weather for them to wander around, and because of the food that you brought to a picnic. Maybe there was a nest nearby. Hornets are less aggressive, so they're not into chasing after you to sting. But if it ends up in your mouth, it'll feel scared and provoked. So it'll try to find its way out and defend itself in any way it can. Similarly, it'll become more aggressive and try to protect its nest if you come too close and it sees you as a threat. If a hornet stings you in your throat or mouth, the impact spot and the surrounding area will probably swell up. It can block your airway, which means the situation can get very, very bad, especially if you're allergic to it. And if that same hornet somehow makes it all the way to your stomach and survives, well, your stomach is full of enzymes and acids that break down the food you eat. Don't underestimate it. That acid is a watery, colorless fluid that can dissolve some pretty strong materials, such as bones and metals, or even other organs in your body. With this in mind, this hornet would have a really tough time staying alive down there. But if it somehow did survive the acid and managed to sting you, your durable and thick stomach lining would likely protect you from any damage. And the hornet wouldn't even have time to try to sting you once again due to the acid. There's almost no chance of this happening to you, but even if it somehow does, it would be in the warm weather because hornets are not active during the winter. When it gets colder outside, the only thing you can find is their abandoned nests. New young queens are the only hornets in the hive that survive, together with their eggs. They protect the eggs in relatively safe areas, such as inside human dwellings or under tree bark. Hornets are social insects that chew wood and turn it into a papery construction pulp. That's how they construct hives. They mature from eggs in the safety of their community hive. Queens are in charge of the hives, and they are the only members that reproduce. Other females work on community duties, like gathering food, building the hive, protecting the whole colony, and feeding the young. Life starts for them in the spring, when the queen's young grow up into workers that take over the chores around the hive. Hornets feed on tree sap, but they're also quite tricky predators that go after bees, flies, and other insects. They prefer to nest in locations that are relatively high above the ground, such as treetops or roofs. That's more private and secure for them to maintain their peaceful life. If some of them decide to nest in the ground, they'll look for abandoned areas such as fields or burrows, hoping no one will disturb them there. They only use their nest once. They don't go back and reuse it from year to year. The queens rest and hibernate elsewhere until they choose a new hive location in the spring. Bees are distant cousins of wasps and hornets. They evolved from ancient predatory wasps, but their family tree separated more than 100 million years ago. Those ancient wasps were really similar to bees. They collected food for their offspring and built and defended their nests whenever it was necessary. Bees are not predators. They're vegetarians that mostly feed on flowers. But their ancestors were more like today's wasps, carnivorous. They used to sting and paralyze other insects and would bring them back for a feast in the nest. The solitary wasps also use their stinger to make predators leave them alone, while social bees and wasps use it to defend their nests. Sometimes bees will sting other bees if they see them as potential danger. 
When keeping their hives safe from outsiders, some bees will act like guards that stay by the entrance and sniff every bee that tries to get inside. If they sense it's a bee that came from another hive to steal some of their nectar, the guard will bite the intruder and even sting it if necessary. Bees are generally less aggressive than wasps, not only because of their peaceful, non-predatory nature. They won't survive after they sting you. So they'll use that move only if they feel like there's really nothing else left to do to defend themselves or their nest. Bees have barbs on their stingers, and they lose them after they sting. A bee won't survive that because it has to self-amputate the stinger after it punctures human skin. And when it does that, a bee loses some important muscles, digestive material, glands, and a venom sac. It's left with a gaping hole at the end of its abdomen. A bee could technically survive after stinging someone, but mammal skin is too fibrous. So it doesn't release the stinger, which bees drive as deep as possible. So when a bee tries to escape, it's already too late. Some honeybees can survive that though, and can sting you multiple times. They are the queen bees. They will rarely leave their nest, but you never know. The queen can live up to five years, and at the peak of its strength, it can lay up to 2,000 eggs per day. Yep, honeybees are pretty cool. They have five eyes, two in front and three on the top of their head. They even have hair on their eyes. These hairs help them to determine flight speed and wind direction to navigate. They're really great at it. Imagine traveling across some country without a rail and road network. <laughs> Impossible, but not for bees. They have bee lines, some insect pathways that run through our towns and the countryside. Bee lines create an imaginative and beautiful network that links wildlife areas together, similar to human railways. They also use the position of the sun while navigating. Plus, they can probably sense the Earth's magnetic field too. Also, they have eyes that are not only hairy, but also sensitive to polarized light. This light penetrates even through pretty thick clouds which is why bees can see the sun, even if we can't. They have four wings, the two on each side hooked together, forming one bigger pair when flying, and then unhook when they're not in the air. Bees are also pretty good dancers. This is the way they communicate with each other. They have two types of dance, the round and the waggle dance. When they go with the round dance, they're sending the message that food is nearby. And when they do waggling, it means their food is farther away. They live in various locations, sand dunes, soft cliffs, wetlands, chalk grasslands, marshes, heathlands, and seawalls. Bees buzz when they fly because they don't flap their wings directly. Their flight muscles pull on the springy thorax wall and then make it ping in and out. Bees have specific muscles they are able to contract multiple times from just one nerve impulse. Because of all this, a bee beats its wings at approximately 200 hertz, or 200 times per second. And that's what we hear and perceive as a buzzing tone. They also produce that tone when they're not flying, but just want to grab some pollen from a flower and shake it onto their body. Bumblebees have smelly feet. They will leave an imprint of their foot odor on flowers they land at. The smell is so strong that some other bumblebee can detect it even 24 hours later. And that's what bumblebees do. They use their smelly footprints to distinguish scents and tell between their own scent, the smell of some stranger, or maybe of some of their relatives. This means they can be more successful in finding food because they can avoid flowers some other insect has already visited. The speed of light is the fastest thing in our universe. It travels across space, passing through Mercury and Venus to reach us, and it's slowing down. No need to panic though, the sun is getting weaker, but we won't see the effects of it for another billion years. In the vacuum of space, the speed of light is around 186,280 miles per second. Any slower than that, and humans would see the changes firsthand. There would be some awesome effects, like colors changing and the brightness of objects fading. We'd also notice some differences in everyday objects, their length and shape. Scientists created a simulation to see what would happen if the speed of light was slower. In a vacuum, the speed of light can't change, but if light passes through different materials and objects, it alters the way we perceive things. Light acts as a wave and a particle, meaning that it's a wavelength. The color and frequency 
are determined by the distance from crest to crest in the wave. It behaves similar to sound with the Doppler effect. Imagine you're standing in the middle of a busy highway and a honking car speeds through. Wow, that was loud. You can hear that whoosh-like sound of the horn because the moving object produces the sound while you're stationary. The frequency and pitch seem to change, but it's just the sound reaching your ear faster than it would if you and the car were both stationary. Light behaves similarly. The wavelengths change if the speed changes. Moving toward a light source and making the wavelength shorter will shift the color to a blue and violet hue. Moving away from the light source and you'll get something more reddish. So if the speed of light slowed down to walking speed, we'd notice the colors changing when we approach an illuminated object. At the same time, the color would change around us and behind us. If you walk sideways, the colors you're walking toward would become bluer and everything in the distance would become red. This information is useful to astronomers who are studying objects in space. If they're blue shifted, that means the object is moving towards us. And if it's red shifted, then it's going in the opposite direction. In fact, everything in the universe is red shifted, proving that the universe is expanding and getting further away from us. The slower it gets, the brighter it becomes. That's because the photons become more present for us to see. At this rate, we can see invisible light and increased intensity. You won't notice that effect much if you're standing still, but because of the Doppler effect, moving towards an object will have different colors and different light intensities. Another phenomenon we'd experience is time dilation. It's when you move at a similar speed as light and time decreases relative to someone who isn't. Space and time are relative, so if you're sitting at your desk wasting hours away, yeah, sounds familiar, doesn't it? All your movement will go through time and not through space. You're stationary, but you're still technically moving forward in time, slowly aging. The faster you move through space, the slower your movement through time will be. If you move at the same speed as light, then all your movement will be through space and not through time. To notice that, you'd need another person to watch you. You're not in a time machine. You're both on Earth, experiencing the same time flow. To you experiencing this firsthand makes it feel like you're going faster because you're getting a lot more movement in space in a given time. The closer you get to the speed of light, the smaller you become. Well, not really, but it depends on who's watching. If you're the one traveling at such a speed, an object nearby will seem small, just as someone who's watching you travel at the speed of light will think that you're smaller than you actually are. The simulation that the MIT scientists conducted showed that if the speed of light drops, everything will become stretched out like a pancake. If you see mountains in the distance and then run at the speed of light, they will appear further away. Objects will become distorted and it will feel like you're getting to a certain place faster because time has slowed down for you. If you're standing completely still and someone standing on your left-hand side throws a cube-shaped object over to your right-hand side, then naturally, you'll see one side of it unless it flips around. But in this new reality, you'll get to see the front side wrapping around the visible side you're seeing. If you're moving at the same speed as light in an infinite space, everything will be stretched out as you reach infinite speeds. In a world where people can walk at the same speed as light, we'll perceive nothing as normal. We'll have to get used to the way we see objects. Every movement we make will result in drastic shifts of colors. Even turning your head to look at something will feel weird. Let's say you're in a supermarket buying groceries and you walk from aisle to aisle. The milk at the end of the counter will look like it's really close to you. But when you approach it, you'll start to feel like it's getting further away from you. The milk will also look a bit red. As soon as you get closer to it, it will shift to blue. If someone is passing through with a shopping cart, you'll see it as a sort of 3D model of a shopping cart. The color will shift as it gets further away from you. It will appear far away, but it's right in front of you. In fact, we don't really know the actual speed of light. Physicists gave it roughly 186,280 miles per second, but that constant is just for them to calculate other scientific stuff so we can understand it better. 
The problem is that we can only measure light with light beams and mirrors. But it's not like all we have to do is point a light beam at a mirror and measure its original path and its reflected path. Einstein's theory of relativity states that the original path of light moving from the source to the mirror may not be the same speed as the reflected light from the mirror back to the source. Hypothetically, if it takes light 10 seconds to travel from the source to the mirror and then back to the source, then we can conclude that each trip takes 5 seconds. But Einstein's theory is that it could take 9 seconds for light to travel from the source to the mirror and only 1 second from the mirror back to the source, or vice versa, or maybe completely different numbers altogether. That's why it's so difficult to measure light. A breakthrough came out for scientists when they managed to slow down the speed of light to zero without losing its brightness. They did this by using ultra-cold atom clouds made with photonic crystals. These crystals are materials punctured with billions of tiny holes where light can refract. But what if we lived in a world where light stopped halfway? You'd wake up one morning and feel like it's twilight. You'd open the curtains and see that many car lights are on but aren't so bright. You turn on the lights in your room but feel like the bulb is tapping out. You replace it with another one, but it doesn't do the trick. You turn on the lights everywhere in your house, but it's all just giving weak light. You're confused and try to check if there's a problem with the electricity in your house, but it seems to be working well. You check on your neighbors, and they also have the same problems. Even experts in the field can't understand what's going on. Hours pass, and it's all the same. All the light in the world seems to have frozen halfway. Your phone is low on brightness, even though you bumped it up to maximum. Everything is getting darker. You learn from the news that it's a global problem. Light is slowly diminishing, and soon there won't be any of it in the world. You decide to wait it out, while everyone else is panicking. It was a quiet and clear night in the countryside, as a lady slept peacefully with her dog calmly at the end of her bed. When, suddenly, a loud crash woke her. Something fell through the ceiling. The dog began barking at the sudden loud noise of the unknown intruder. As the lady gathered her senses and wiped her face, she turned on the light. She looked around her room, trying to find the cause of the noise. She was shocked and confused to see a great hole in the ceiling. And directly below, right next to where her head was just lying, she saw a rock the size of her fist. Shaken, she immediately called the responsible person as she thought, but he advised that the rock was likely from a nearby construction site. This added further confusion as she was in the middle of nowhere. Nothing could have caused this to her knowledge. The next day, the responsible people visited to investigate. Further, the more detailed analysis showed that it wasn't just any rock, but a meteorite. Did you know that the chances of getting under a meteorite are about 1 in 250,000? It seems like relatively good odds. However, just for comparison, the odds of meeting a shark is 1 in 3.5 million. Do you often fly by plane? Perhaps you fancy your chances with the weather. Being caught in a tornado is a possibility of 1 in 13 million. And if you are a bit of a risk-taker, the chances of you winning the big lottery is 1 in 292 million. So, given the odds, it would appear that a meteor fall would be a pretty common occurrence. Yet there are very few known instances of anyone getting by one. The Canadian woman who received the unexpected guest was lucky that it was a small stone. In 2013, an asteroid entered the Earth's atmosphere to the territory of the city of Russia with a population of 1 million people. Little did a cab driver realize, as he drove his cab, that an asteroid entering Earth's atmosphere was the most prominent object from space to enter Earth's atmosphere in over 100 years, measuring 66 feet wide. Everybody knows asteroids are gigantic objects revolving around our sun that aren't planets or moons. They're made from rocks and dust and come in all kinds of weird shapes. The largest is at about 329 miles in diameter. Asteroids mostly live within the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. You can imagine what a journey it made to the Earth on that day. Given that the asteroid belt is so extensive and populated with all sorts of debris, collisions between objects are very likely. 
as the objects collide with one another, their trajectory changes, leading them outside of the asteroid belt. And on that day, it launched them in the direction of our planet. The city taxi driver dropped off his fare as the asteroid entered the atmosphere. The man saw many people on the street pointing to the sky. He got out of his cab and looked in the same direction. He saw a long tail of smoke across the sky with a bright object at the head of it, hurtling towards Earth at an unimaginable speed. As the atmospheric pressure slowed and heated the asteroid, causing it to glow brighter, it sped towards Earth. The man, unable to turn away, stood mesmerized. He watched on as the asteroid became brighter and brighter until it became brighter than the sun for a moment. The man turned his head away and covered with his arms to block the flash, as it was too blinding to look directly towards it. But as the asteroid reached its peak luminosity, it broke apart into several pieces that then continued falling towards the ground. Startled, the man looked around. The people on the street were also standing silent and unsure of what had just transpired. Suddenly, they heard multiple loud bangs in the near distance. The Earth shook as the falling pieces of the asteroid hit the Earth. Windows within buildings surrounding the street shattered. Cars parked had their alarms activated by the vibrations. Some people ran, but others in the street stood frozen, looking around at one another, still trying to make sense of what had just happened. The ground affected was extensive, covering up to 60 miles wide. Windows were shattered throughout the town. As the dust settled and repairs were made, scientists analyzed the pieces of the asteroid to identify where it had come from. They found that a collision within the asteroid belt had indeed caused it, and this 66-foot intruder was only a tiny piece of an even more giant asteroid. Given the crowded location when the asteroid fell, it was a miracle that no one was physically hit. There has only been one case where a meteorite had made physical contact with a person. It happened in 1954 in the USA. A lady was relaxing on her sofa, enjoying a short nap, when suddenly she was woken by a jolt in the side of her belly. The asteroid had been noticed by many in the same area. Reports were recorded that it had been the size of a basketball as it fell towards Earth. But after it burned up in the atmosphere and crashed through the woman's house, it had shrunk significantly by the time it made contact with her. After it was confirmed it was an intruder from space, the American lady then became the first and only recorded person on Earth hit by a meteorite. Within the asteroid belt, the asteroids also share their home with comets. Comets share the same ranges in size as the asteroids, but they're mainly made of ice. They can also have bits of rock and dust within their body. Comets have a long tail following behind them, which is made from their interaction with the Sun. Comets aren't only located within the asteroid belt. They're well known to have all kinds of paths, not only restricted to just within our solar system. Some sightings of these periodic comets are documented in human history, appearing on infrequent occasions as they make their long journey throughout the solar system. Most notably is Halley's Comet, which can be visible on Earth on average once every 76 years. The last one was about 36 years ago. The first known record by humans of Halley's Comet was as far as 240 BCE. Halley's Comet is next expected to say hello in about 40 years from now. So make sure you get your telescopes ready. Asteroids and comets are big and scary for sure. And we all know that the dinosaurs were not able to detect the asteroid that impacted the Earth, which ended their reign on this planet. But luckily for us humans, we have scientists carefully observing our solar system. Asteroids and comets are so large that they can be easily detected, so there's nothing to be concerned about soon. Now that we have the concerning space rocks out of the way, let's move on to their smaller relatives, the smallest being meteors made from rock and dust that are so small that they burn up within our atmosphere, having no impact other than a light show. Meteor showers provide the most exciting display for all your novice astronomers out there. Meteor showers are very common, occurring around 30 times per year. They're easily predicted when to occur. You'll just need to ensure you're outside of the city on a clear night and be sure to bring a blanket along with you. But why do we get meteor showers, and why are they so easily predicted? Well, it all relates to how the comet gets its tail. 
When the heat from the sun interacts with the comet and separates gases and pieces of the comet, the Earth then orbits into the path of that same debris, which creates the magnificent display of the meteor shower. Being that meteors are too small to reach the ground of the Earth and burn up in our atmosphere, what if they could reach Earth? Well, they would then be called meteorites, made up of the same ingredients as meteors, but ultimately, we would only find solid rock if we happened to come across them. What's interesting about meteorites is that they are pieces of an ancient puzzle that have been flying around space for millions to billions of years. They could even been flying aimlessly in space longer than our sun has been burning brightly in our sky. Our solar system will continue to provide more surprises for us to learn from, just like the asteroid that arrived in Russia in 2013, which scientists only overlooked due to another asteroid that was being monitored closely on the very same day. But as we continue to have these experiences, we will continue to learn from them. And hopefully, when the next big one flies by, we'll be ready. Whoosh! Your spaceship is almost there! Thanks to the latest technologies, you can now travel to any planet in our solar system faster than ever before. And we can finally visit other planets completely safely. You applied for a space tour, and now you're on a ship with your guide, astronauts, and a couple of other passengers. First stop? The smallest planet in our solar system, Mercury. It's only a third of Earth's distance to the Sun. The view is going to be spectacular. As soon as your ship lands on the solid surface of this rocky planet, you see an endless universe, stars, passing comets, and the Sun, three times bigger than we see it from Earth, with no clouds to interfere with the view. There are no moons. Mercury and Venus don't have any. You try to move, but because of your spacesuit and reduced gravity, it feels like you're on a trampoline in a slow-motion movie. It's not safe to come here during the day. On Mercury, it lasts almost 59 Earth days. Although your spacesuit keeps you safe, temperatures can get pretty extreme. During the day, they go up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. There's no atmosphere to keep the heat, so temperature during the night can drop down to minus 290 degrees. That's why Mercury isn't the hottest planet, even though it's closest to the Sun. Venus is the second closest, but it has an atmosphere that retains the heat. You're safe in your special spacesuit, but it will still be really hard to go through such drastic temperature changes, so you need to hurry. Mercury has weaker gravity because it weighs less than Earth, which means the gravity on Mercury pulls less on your body. If a person weighs 100 pounds on Earth, they'd weigh 38 pounds on Mercury. And you do feel lighter. Hurry up, we don't have much time! You hear your guide's voice in your spacesuit. He's standing next to you, pointing his finger. Look to your left! That's why we're here! Caloris Basin. Amazing! Mercury has such a thin atmosphere, there's nothing to protect the planet from asteroids slamming into its surface. It has the most craters in our solar system, which is why it reminds you of the moon. And now you're there, looking at the Caloris Basin the biggest impact crater in the entire solar system, formed almost 4 billion years ago by an object at least 60 miles long. You can see its rocky interior, filled with deep fractures and high sharp ridges, surrounded by the highest mountains you can find on this planet, towering 2 miles above numerous lava vents. They used to be active. The other side that's hidden from the sun has tiny deposits of ice, which is the only form of water here, but you don't have time to see it. Mercury is only a temporary stop before you keep moving. As soon as you get comfortable on the ship, you see your guide approaching you. Eh, we can't stop on Venus, he says. Sometimes we can at least get closer to the surface, if not land and go out. But today, <laughs> the winds are crazy. They're usually a little over 220 miles per hour, and they keep the yellow or bright white clouds of the planet in constant motion. Volcanic activity formed the surface of Venus. 90% of it is solidified basalt lava, so it might not be the best place to visit anyway. Also, it has a dense atmosphere. While inside the spaceship, you get a video call on the special space communication system from your friend. She took some time off a little bit earlier than you did and went to Jupiter. Now Jupiter is a gas giant, so there's nowhere you can land. Also, the pressure is really strong. It squishes gas into a liquid. So Jupiter's atmosphere could crush any metal spaceship that goes through the colorful clouds like it's made of paper. Visitors mostly take day trips to see it, cruising in their spaceships, taking pictures from above. It's crazy because that planet is like a stormy whirlpool of wind, 
and it has the brightest auroras in the entire solar system. Your friend even saw the Great Red Spot. It's a giant oval-shaped storm moving in a counterclockwise direction. It was amazing! The red spot is four times bigger than Earth. But the real treat was Europa, Jupiter's sixth moon. Scientists believe it's young because of its smooth and relatively untouched surface. Europa is a big oceanic world with all the right ingredients for life we haven't discovered yet. They even offer you tours where you try to discover if there's anything waiting under a thick ice shelf. Visitors have to wear some special, extra-protective spacesuits because Europa receives huge amounts of radiation from Jupiter. And there's Io, another one of Jupiter's moons, which is colorful and just the most beautiful thing ever. It's the place with more volcanic activity than Earth and has the most active volcanoes in our solar system. Over 400 volcanoes! 150 of them can erupt any time. Jupiter's gravity pushes the volcano's activity. It squeezes Io like a rubber ball, and that results in volcanoes. You wish you could have been there with her, but right now you're going towards your next location. Days pass by, and at one moment, you see Earth from a distance. You feel a little bit nostalgic, thinking about your friends and family. But after a while, you get excited as you see your next destination. Finally, it's the Red Planet. You hear the distant and muffled sound of the spaceship landing on the rusty surface. Everything around you is just a barren, giant desert. The wind is strong, kicking up dust. That's how those huge alien sand dunes are made. And the storm will come these days, they say. Billions of years ago, Mars had liquid water on its surface. Lakes and rivers, maybe even life around or inside them. Its axis of rotation is a bit tilted, so Mars has seasons similar to those on our planet. When one hemisphere is tilted closer to the sun, it's spring and summer. The other hemisphere that's tilted away gets fall and winter. The atmosphere on Mars is way thinner than ours, so the planet can't trap that much heat near its surface. Air pressure on Mars is around 50 times lower than that atop Mount Everest. You arrive at the Space Hotel. Mars is the only planet with such hotels at the moment. On the other planets, you sleep in your spaceship, because they can offer conditions safe enough for people to stay there for a longer time. The staff of this hotel is great. They got used to tourists because Mars is the most visited location in our solar system. The food there is great, and you can't wait to eat it and get some sleep. The next day, you wake up at dawn to get ready for some skiing with your group. Days on Mars are approximately the same length as they are on Earth. It was snowing all night, but because of the dry, low-pressure atmosphere, snow never stays for too long, so you need to take a chance. Mars has amazing mountains and valleys, and those icy polar caps were so cool. Oh, and look at those volcanoes! The next day, a small aircraft specially designed to transfer you across the planet comes and picks you up for a day trip to Olympus Mons, the biggest volcano in our solar system. It's 16 miles above the surface, three times taller than our Everest. You land at the outer edge of the volcano. The peak is so high, it seems to go beyond the horizon. On the third day, you visit Velis Marineus, the iconic canyon system you could only see in pictures until now. Its network of chasms is amazing, five times longer and four times deeper than our Grand Canyon. At its widest point, it's 200 miles across. You decide to spend the next five days in the southern hemisphere. There's another hotel there where you can book day trips to numerous extinct volcanoes in the area. Everything is covered in dust in different shades of red, orange, and brown from iron rust. But the sky is dusty all the time. You even get caught in a storm once, so no one can leave the hotel the entire day. You look at the sun, which is a bit more distant than we see it from Earth. You miss your planet where you can walk around without special suits, feel the fresh breeze, swim in the ocean, or have coffee with your loved ones. There's one more place to see before going home. It's more dangerous and complicated to visit than the others. Cygnus constellation Kepler-16b a planet that orbits two stars and actually has two sunsets, so you'll have two shadows. The planet is made of gas and rock, so it's going to be tricky to land. But the new adventure is waiting, and time to set off! You can feel the waves brushing up against you. You wake up and see that you're a giant standing up on two feet in the sea. So much water starts dripping down like rain. You're way taller than the Statue of Liberty. You look at your hands and compare them to a small hot dog stand below you. 
you pick it up and fit it on the palm of your hand before crushing it by accident. Suddenly, you feel a slight sting on your ankle. You look down and see that some people are shoving you away, while most people are running away in fear. Some are taking pictures of you, while others are shouting at you to go away. You take a step to the main road and crush a car with no one inside. The people below you disperse like ants. You walk further into the city and notice there's a huge wall surrounding the rest of the city. You walk towards the city, crushing everything below you on your way. You see other giants stand up on the horizon near the sea and walk toward the barricaded city. Something is calling all of you to go there. Many people stand on the wall and sound the alarm. More people join them to defend the wall. Others evacuate and hide in tiny holes. You notice some of the giants have very odd features and disproportionate limbs. Some are walking on all fours, while some have really long arms that can reach anything. You move a bit when you accidentally almost step on someone. She stands still. You pick her up and put her on your eye level. Both of you are maintaining eye contact. You place her on your shoulder while the other giants walk past you towards the city. They push and shove you while you're standing still. They break through the wall without any effort and ruin the city. For some reason, you snap out of this trance that was drawing you to the city. You turn around and head back to the sea with the woman still on your shoulder. You reach the deepest end of the sea and are still walking. The woman is scared and doesn't know what to do. You place her on a small island and stare at her. She can't see the sun because your head is in the way. For a while, you leave her there while you bask in the sun, trying to make sense of why you're on this planet and what made you want to save this woman. Nighttime comes and you're feeling sleepy. The woman falls asleep under a tree. You stand still while the waves rock you back and forth. Suddenly, the waves get rougher and you feel something moving in the water. You look around but it's too dark to see what's going on. You quickly pick up the woman and place her on your shoulder. She wakes up. You see the giants swimming and walking towards you, screaming. They start chasing you, trying to catch up with you. You walk as fast as you can, disturbing the water and breaking the ocean floor. You see a cargo ship in front of you and move it aside carefully, not to damage it but the giants chasing after you don't seem to care about the ship and sink it while trying to get to you. You feel you've reached shallower grounds and so you start running. You're in a new country that's been leveled by the giants. The buildings are completely flat and the debris is scattered like small breadcrumbs. In the distance, you can see some more giants waking up by the beach and staring at you. They can smell the human on your shoulder and start chasing you. They're also strange looking and have unusual features. There's no place to hide in the open, so you head to the mountains. Over there, you can hide in the valley near a large waterfall. You notice that your skin starts changing color and you blend in with the environment. Every giant has a unique feature for them to discover. Apparently yours is changing your skin color. The woman on your shoulder is asleep. You look at her and start feeling a sense of sympathy, like looking at a pet. You're not the same as the other giants. You don't crave destruction, but instead want to help humans. You hear some giants walking in the distance. You take a peek and see some new giants that are three times bigger than you. They're patrolling around looking for you and they're getting closer. You accidentally make some noise and they spot you. They start running after you. And you get up and start running away. You're sprinting through some rough terrain. Some other giants jump in front of you while the ones chasing you stand behind you. You're surrounded by five giants that are all three times bigger than you. You place the woman down in a safe place and prepare to protect yourself. They try to tackle you from all sides, but you jump and dodge them. The biggest one gets his hands on you and tries to pin you down, but you slip out and push him away. 
The rest of them try to catch you, but you move and avoid their grasp. You see a steep cliff and head over there while they're following you. You have your back to the cliff while they're inching their way to you. They jump at you, but you duck down. They fall over the cliff and into the ocean. The biggest one is still there since it knew what you were up to. One on one, you have no chance against him. You can smell the woman trying to run away into a stampede of giants heading your way. Your skin color changes and you slip through the alpha giant and rush to the woman to save her. The alpha isn't as fast as you, so you can easily outrun it. But the stampede is about to trample her. You jump in front of them and catch the woman. The other giants are startled and angry because you saved the woman. All of the giants know about you now and are out to get you. A few days later, and they seem to be off your tail. You're now in the middle of the desert. The woman is still on your shoulder. She built herself a small shelter where she could sleep without being disturbed. You're trying your best to get out of the desert since anyone can spot you. You're tired and are in need of water. You're barely carrying your feet in the sand. You sit down, trying to keep your head up, but the sun is too intense. You're sweating a lot, and it's dripping down on the woman. She tries to speak with you, but you can't understand what she's saying. You're getting weaker and can't move anymore. It's only noon, so the sun is at its peak. You create a shady spot for the woman with your hand to protect her from the burning sun. The day passes and the night arrives. You spent all day in the sun and are now in the desert cold. It's freezing. You cup the woman and put your other hand on top to create a warm dome to protect her from the cold wind. It's pitch dark and you don't know where you're going. You just keep walking and stepping on sand dunes everywhere you go. It's daytime again. You see a large footprint of a giant like no other. Looks like it's even bigger than the huge one by the cliff. You run away as fast as you can, but there's nowhere to hide. Suddenly, you see it standing still. It towers over every other giant you've ever encountered. It's sleeping and gaining energy from the sun. Some giants are accustomed to different climates and terrains. This one is tall and it can reach the sun for more sunlight. You tiptoe around it, making sure not to wake it, but it can feel everything around it. It's startled and starts chasing you until you reach the ocean. He isn't a fan of water, so he stays on the surface, screaming at you as you swim off. Day one. You jolt awake, totally disoriented. What's going on? Your house is shaking and trembling. It must be an earthquake. You grab your pillow and your cat. He's just as confused as you are and doesn't even put up a fight. What else? Your documents? Laptop? Huh? It seems your house is moving. You see the trees growing in your garden pass by the window. You're rooted to the spot. Your cat clutched to your chest. The building around you, your 30-year-old home, is cracking, screeching, and making all kinds of unsettling noises. Loud crashing sounds coming from your kitchen hint at the possibility of your newest tea set getting shattered at the moment. The furniture is moving around your bedroom. You have to grab onto the wall. Oh, look at that. You're already in your neighbor's garden, and your house has apparently decided to take a break. It stopped. With your legs shaking, you carefully get out of the building. The cat is suspiciously quiet in your arms. Mr. Brown is already waiting for you under an apple tree. He's pale and his eye is twitching. After speaking for a while, you two come to a conclusion that it might have been a landslide. It's still unclear how to return your house to where it used to stand. But you both agree it's a problem for another day. Day 2. In the morning, everything seems okay. Well, your house is still in your neighbor's garden, and your cat refuses to leave his favorite shoebox, but nothing more dramatic has happened overnight. The weekend is over, and you get into your car. Time to go to your office. While driving, you keep doing double takes. It feels as if many buildings in your town have swapped their places. Weird. At work, you immediately notice some commotion. It turns out that not only your house was influenced by that terrible landslide, other than that, the day is quiet. 
If you ignore the fact that your office building seems to jump once or twice and do something that you describe as stretching its muscles. When you're driving home, not only your left, but also your right eyebrow is twitching. Not far from your house, you get stuck in a huge traffic jam. Anxious people leave their cars, trying to figure out what's going on. Oh, it's a house. A two-story lovely cottage is standing in the middle of the road. Another landslide? It becomes harder to make yourself believe in this story. There's no trail of ruined grass, bushes, or soil that a landslide would have left behind. Plus, your town is located on a perfectly flat plain. You take another road and soon park near your house. The only problem? Your house is missing! It's neither in its usual place nor in your neighbor's garden. You knock on Mr. Brown's door. Oh, your house! It's gone away! He says and giggles. You can only stare at the trembling man. Mr. Brown continues. At around 10 a.m., your house started shaking. Then it slowly lifted itself over the ground. It was very loud. I saw something resembling four sturdy legs. Then your house stretched upward, wiggled a bit, and set off to the north. Oh, here's your cat. And Mr. Brown hands you your poor pet, scared but unscathed. You take the animal, get back into your car, and drive to your sister's house. Her family is in front of the TV, watching the latest news. Your house isn't the only one that decided to make a run for it. Hundreds of buildings all over the country and the whole world have started to move. You listen to scientists, professors, and experts. They claim it's a new reality that people will just have to accept. For some inexplicable reason, all kinds of buildings can migrate now. No one in the entire world can explain this outstanding phenomenon. Day 3. You wake up to the news that thousands of cities and towns have disappeared overnight. In the morning, people who fell asleep in big cities found themselves in forests, at the seaside, or near lakes. One apartment building got stuck in a swamp. Another decided to have a rest too close to a cliff edge. In both cases, the authorities had to evacuate people and send huge cranes to save the buildings. Day 10. You accidentally come across your house. It's moved to another part of the city, to a much nicer district than the one you used to live in. It takes you little time to realize that you also like this area much more. You go to grab your stuff from your sister's house. You speed up on your way back, thinking your house might have disappeared again. But no, when you're back, it's still there, waiting for you. You could swear the entire building looks guilty. Your cat is trying to twist out of your arms. The animal doesn't trust this huge moving box anymore. Day 20. You've got used to waking up in a new place every morning. You try to perceive the situation as an exciting adventure. One day, you woke up on a steep slope of a large hill. At first, you were pleasantly surprised. Your house is a romantic at heart. The sunrise view from your bedroom window was stunning. But two hours later, it became obvious your house was stuck. You had no idea how it managed to climb so high in the darkness, but it was painfully obvious it couldn't get back to solid ground. Luckily, there are now tons of special services that can help you in this situation. That time, it took the efforts of two cranes and one cargo helicopter to save your house. Anyway, that's how Earth has changed in just one month. Most people have moved out of their apartments and houses. Tents are gaining immense popularity. These days, Tent producers are quickly becoming some of the most successful and richest people on the planet. They've started developing state-of-the-art products with temperature control, built-in Wi-Fi, different kinds of lighting, you name it. The newest tents can easily withstand sub-zero temperatures and protect their inhabitants from the summer heat. Another advantage of living in a tent? It won't go away, taking along you and your stuff. Cities have mostly disappeared. It's impossible to control them. Not with buildings that can start wandering around or set off on a journey at literally any moment. While moving, buildings ruin roads and highways. They knock down street and traffic lights and road signs. Now you can never find a grocery store nearby. And your favorite diner always turns up in a different district. Those people who don't want to live in tents have to migrate along with cities and buildings every day. And it's extremely tiring. You never know if you find your home after leaving for an hour to take your dog for a walk. Schedules, appointments, and timetables just don't exist anymore. 
There's no point in setting up a time if you don't know how much it'll take you to get to your destination. You're always late for work in the morning because you never know where your office is. First, you need to locate it with the help of a special newly developed app. But while you're driving there, your office building can easily change its location. And then the chase begins. Well, on the bright side, people have become way fitter. You often leave your house to run some errands, but in the end, all you do is run after your house, the wanderer. Google Maps are useless now. With no buildings staying where they're supposed to be, there's no use for this app. If you need to visit someone or find some place you've never been to before, you can hardly find the address. There are no more streets and no more house numbers. But the worst thing is earthquakes. Imagine a 100-story skyscraper moving around. No wonder the ground under its feet is shaking like crazy. This leads to smaller human-made constructions like bridges, dams, or power lines collapsing. In some places, it results in fires and floods. The moving buildings also produce a lot of deafening noise. Most people find it impossible to sleep at night. They have to catch some Zs during the day because, for some bizarre reason, buildings prefer moving at night. Day 45. Today, you've managed to get to your office. You flop down into your chair and look around. Your colleagues look bad. All of them have large, dark circles under their eyes. Even the slightest noise makes them jump. They're nervous and tired. You see your own reflection in your computer monitor. You look no better. If scientists don't find the solution soon, civilization will collapse. You're sitting in the car, waiting for the traffic light to turn green. The temperature's so high today, it seems the city is about to melt. You look at the traffic light and notice it's deforming. Drops are dripping down from it. You don't believe this is really happening, so you're rubbing your eyes with your palms and you find your silver ring is slowly flowing down your finger. You scream in fear because you expect the molten metal to scorch your skin, but nothing happens. The traffic light completely drains down. You want to press the gas pedal, but there's only some kind of liquid under your feet. The seat belt unfastens itself, and the car slowly sags. You open the door, and it falls off. You run out of the car and watch it slowly melt. The wheels, the blue body, the internal details, the motor, everything turns into liquid. Only the tires, plastic things, seats, car carpets, and glass remain intact. You hear screams behind you, and you see all the other cars around are melting. You want to record it on video, but your phone has become liquid too. You take out the remaining glass screen in the plastic case. All the metals around are melting. Street lamps and bus stops turn into a homogeneous mass. Suddenly, it gets completely silent. Car horns, the noise from the highway, sirens, exhaust fumes, and engine roars. All of it has disappeared. Rivers of liquid metal are flowing down the streets, and you're in the center of this. The metal stream carries away the tires and other car details. It knocks people down. Then, a low, loud noise sounds through the city. People are running out of malls, libraries, cafes, homes, business centers. Puddles form around all houses. Every building is equipped with metal structures, rebars, and fittings. Now it's all melting and seeping through the concrete. Metals are melting slowly, so people have time to evacuate from the city. All the buildings are collapsing and raising dust in the air. Sewerage hatchways are flowing downwards. The city's sewer system is melting. Water mixed with liquid metal comes out on the streets. People are swimming in this mass. They're using hundreds of thousands of rubber tires as life buoys. Someone's even riding a surfboard. Liquid coins are flowing out of your wallet. Hundreds of ATMs around the city are melting. Millions of paper banknotes are drowning in metal flows. All the gold reserves become liquid and paint the city with an orange color. Thousands of letters float on melting mailboxes. All data centers, computers, and servers become a part of the huge metal stream. Instantly, all the digital information in the world disappears. Televisions, game consoles, amusement theme parks are melting. Radio receivers, telephones, electrical wires, cables, and internet connections disappear. Millions of tons of metal fill in the street, then pour into rivers and oceans. The water is getting a dark silver shade. In one day, People lose all modern technologies and return to the Stone Age. Metal rivers flood cities. People run to the countryside. Bicycles, motorcycles, and other forms of transportation are gone. City residents are deprived of electricity and all things that are powered by electricity. It's not safe to be in a natural area either. Metals are hidden in the mountains and underground. Now they turn into liquid. 
and cause deformation inside the soil and stone. Some mountains are ruined, like a melting hill of ice cream. Earthquakes shake the ground all over the world. Seismic activity wakes up volcanoes. They splash out a huge amount of lava and cover the sky with ash. Volcanic magma contains a lot of molten metals, but now they don't solidify. Pools of cold lava are formed around volcanoes. People learn to live anew in such conditions. They build houses out of plastic and wood, using ropes and glue to connect the materials. You can now easily start a fire with wood and stone. People burn glass to make it stronger. They make axes and other tools from high-strength glass and stone. But such items quickly deteriorate and break. You learn how to build dugouts. You drip the soil and use wooden boards to support the ceilings and walls. Almost the entire population of the planet lives underground, since it helps keep warm during winter. But it's not possible to live like this for a long time because of frequent earthquakes. Wooden chariots appear on the roads again. Problems with the harvest begin. Metals seep into the soil, and this disrupts the growth of the crops. Many people live near the ocean. During earthquakes, they get on wooden rafts or inflatable boats and sail away from the shore. To travel long distances, people fly in balloons. You can even get to a neighboring city if the wind doesn't take you away. It's impossible to send a letter to another country since there's no more railways. People make long walking journeys and live like nomads. You use pigeon mail to communicate with friends living in the neighboring city. It's difficult to get food and live in winter without electricity. But there is hope. Scientists can't find out the reason for the change of metals without technical equipment. But they put forward the theory that metals have changed at the molecular level. The molecules moved away from each other, and this caused melting. To bring everything back, you need to connect the metal molecules closer to each other. And people need an electric current for this. Fortunately, there's enough of it in the sky. Every day, lightning flashes somewhere. You just need to catch it. Scientists create plastic containers and fill them with liquid metal. All containers are connected by a rubber wire with molten copper inside. Copper is one of the best conductive metals. On a huge field, people place hundreds of such containers. Clouds are gathering. A strong storm begins. The lightning strikes the ground several times and finally hits the container. It comes through a copper wire and distributes the charge to all other tanks. A chain reaction begins. When the storm ends, people discover containers with solid metal. It worked! Now we have a couple of tons of ordinary metals. Scientists send male pigeons to spread the news. Soon, people around the world are trying to catch the lightning. The resulting metals are enough to build minimal equipment for a power plant. Scientists use electricity from power plants to turn metals into powerful magnets. Liquid iron, copper, and aluminum seep deep into the ground in the ocean. To get them out of there, people build metal mining stations. First, they make a deep hole in the ground, then lower a huge magnet there. Liquid metals pass through the soil and stick to the magnet. People use the extracted materials to build new magnetic stations. They install them all over the world. Huge magnets appear in the seas, rivers, and oceans. People pump all the liquid metal out of the water and make it solid with an electric charge. Then, people create metal tools, axes, saws, machine tools, anvils, spokes, and wheels. Then, they make metal fittings and frames for houses. Life is slowly improving. People make chains, bicycles, and rebuild factories. They restore railways and launch the first trains. A new industrial era has come again. Iron, nickel, and aluminum are more expensive than gold because of a huge demand for them. Also, separating liquid copper from liquid silver and other metal separating operations is a difficult task. This increases the price too. When solid metals become abundant, their price begins to fall. Previously, to get iron, people dug deep quarries in mines where they extracted iron ore. Now, metals are liquid and they attract themselves thanks to magnetic forces. You can stick a long magnet in the ground in your backyard, and the next day, it will be covered with iron. Easy metal mining accelerates technological growth. Now you don't need furnaces to melt steel or silver. You immediately get them in liquid form. You can pour metals into a jar and store them forever in liquid form. And an electric charge can make them solid. The first planes and ships appear. The international export and import of goods are fully restored. But the fastest thing people restored is power lines in the internet. In one century, humanity has managed to completely rebuild modern technologies. 
You're sitting in a car in a space shopping mall parking lot. You've just bought a gift for your sister's birthday and should have time to get it to the celebration. Today, there are a lot of people in the mall, so it's difficult to leave the parking lot. Finally, you're approaching the gate. You press the button next to the steering wheel and activate the gravity cushion. It allows the car to hover above the ground at several inches. The car wheels are sliding inside the body and a huge turbine is coming out of the trunk. The front glass becomes a touch panel with many buttons and screens. The gate opens, the turbine releases a flame, and your car flies out of the parking lot, right into outer space. Thousands of flying cars are rushing past you on an invisible space highway. You're moving away from the mall, which looks like a huge space station surrounded by holograms of advertising brands. Before Earth, you need to get to Mars. There, you want to repair the car's engine. The navigator plans a route to the red planet, and you go on your way. You're far from Earth's orbit, so you can get to Mars in several hours. You activate the autopilot and decide to take a little nap. It's 2048. The world's population has exceeded 20 billion people. There's too little space on Earth. Humanity is not ready to colonize other planets yet. So scientists and engineers from all countries start building huge space stations. This unloads the planet by more than 50%. The stations look like huge rings. They imitate the Earth's atmosphere, have artificial gravity and vegetation. People move to stations, but often return to Earth. Rockets fly between the planet and orbit. But such transport is expensive and inconvenient. Automakers make efforts at creating super-reactive flying cars. Some years later, people slowly colonize the Moon and Mars. Now, getting to the Red Planet is as easy as getting to the neighboring city. Cars fly along certain routes that are similar to airways for planes. Engineers create special digital highways that can only be seen through the windshield. Of course, you can fly through space as you like, in any direction. But if you fly to a mall or the moon, you have to stick to the established digital route. You wake up and approach Mars. People almost don't live here because of the unfavorable atmosphere and difficult weather conditions. But Mars has the biggest service center for cars and the coolest amusement theme park in the solar system. To get there, people have to stand in a space traffic jam for hours. The dashboard shows you have some problems with the turbine. You put on a spacesuit, take a laser screwdriver, and get out of the car. You're in zero gravity, flying up to the turbine and fixing the problem with the screwdriver. There are thousands of cars around you. People are yawning inside, listening to music, and watching movies. You get into the vehicle and slowly move on. The engine or turbine often fails in the middle of a space highway. When this happens, your car activates its emergency mode. The dashboard automatically sends a signal to the nearest repair team. You're just floating in space and waiting until the mechanics arrive. They tow the car to the nearest auto service. You have enough oxygen inside for a couple of days. And if you run out of it, you can ask for help on the internet. Good people flying by will stop and share their oxygen supplies with you. Finally, you get to the car service station. Mechanics install a new super jet engine for your car and repair the turbine. There's not much time left, and you promised your sister you wouldn't be late. You get into the car and leave the Martian orbit at full speed. The new engine runs silently and doesn't shake the car. You increase the speed and fly along an almost empty digital highway. On your way, you meet a lot of small satellites showing holographic ads. Fortunately, you have an ad blocker. You turn it on, and the space banners become invisible through your windshield. Finally, you see a small blue dot. This is Earth. At this moment, you remember that you need to feed your dog. You leave the route and fly to the moon. There you have a small cottage with a house, which you bought for a small price last year. People can't change the atmosphere of entire planets yet, but you can install a small dome and fill it with oxygen. Inside your dome, you've built a house, a swimming pool, and even a small vegetable garden. In the past, People went to the countryside to take a break from the city bustle. Now, everyone just buys houses on the moon. You fly through the dome, land on the white surface, and put food into a dog bowl. 
They're renovating your apartment on the space ring, so you live on the moon with your dog for a while. You can see other cars flying up into the neighboring domes. Some vehicles are elite supercars with a large gravity cushion and ultra-reactive engines. They can fly 10 times faster than the speed of sound and have artificial intelligence that can talk to the driver. There are also old, rusty space cars. Sometimes people attach a jet engine to an ordinary car and cover the body with a mix of copper, iron, and silver to travel over long distances in a cold vacuum. You can also see a lot of taxis in outer space. Sometimes getting to the moon is cheaper than getting to the other end of some city on Earth. The reason is traffic jams on the Earth's roads. Also, there are a lot of flying buses in space. Every day, several flights depart on the Earth to Moon to Mars route. People are constantly building something on Mars. The huge car service and the amusement park are done. Now they're creating a scientific center there to study interstellar jumps. Of course, engineers need building materials for such construction projects. Several times a week, long trains fly from Earth to Mars along a separate space route. Initially, trains carried people, but they became unprofitable. It's much cheaper and faster to get to Mars by your own car or bus. Finally, you're leaving the moon and approaching the Earth. The dashboard signals you're out of fuel, so you decide to stop at a gas station. These stations are everywhere. They're fully automated, controlled by artificial intelligence. You're flying up to one of them. The fuel pump is automatically connected to your gas tank. The super reactive engine consumes improved rocket fuel instead of gas. You transfer money to the station through the touch panel and fly away. Mm. Hundreds of digital space highways lead to Earth, and every road is filled with cars. Traffic jams again. There are security checkpoints in the upper layers of the atmosphere. Customs services check documents and car trunks. While standing in traffic, you're watching garbage trucks. A lot of space debris is floating around. Slow-flying trucks controlled by artificial intelligence collect garbage in huge containers. Then, they fly away from Earth's orbit and unhook the containers. These garbage cans have little turbines that let containers fly far beyond our solar system. Then, they heat up and burn all the garbage from the inside. Finally, you pass all the checkpoints and fly into the middle layers of the atmosphere. Our planet looks like a huge cyberpunk world, but only lighter and more beautiful. Huge cars disperse the clouds to improve visibility. Firefighter flying ships are coming to one of the stations where a fire started. You encounter hundreds of gas stations, air hotels, cinemas, and shopping malls in the sky before you reach the ground. You're approaching a parking building. This is an 80-story skyscraper filled with cars. People leave their vehicles and use elevators to go down. Fortunately, there's a place near your sister's house where you can park your car. You land, put your hand on the passenger seat to take the gift, and... Oh no! It looks like you left it on the moon! You're walking through the park with your lovely little poodle. You throw the ball. The pet runs after it and brings it back. You throw again, and he's running happily. Then he stops. The poodle freezes, shivers, then turns around and looks at you. Get it, Snowball! But he doesn't listen. Then you approach the ball, pick it up, and look at the dog. Snowball stares at you with a piercing look. You throw the ball next to him. Snowball, take it! The dog puts his paw on the ball, then slowly shakes his head as a sign of refusal. You're a little scared and look around. You notice some other people in the park also have problems with their pets. Some dogs are barking at their owners. Others are running around. Your poodle looks at you like you've done something bad. Then it goes away. You're running after Snowball, asking him to come back. You leave the park and find yourself on the road. You can hear the creaking of tires nearby. Several people are running in your direction. They're scared. You try to ask them what's happened, but after a second, you understand it yourself. Several elephants, zebras, lions, and gorillas are moving along the road. They jump on cars, demolish hydrants, knock people off their feet. Elephants are screaming through their trunks. When they run past you, you notice penguins sitting on the back of these huge animals. 
you don't forget about Snowball and decide to find your dog. You're wandering through the streets, meeting other people who lost their pets too. You've got a lot of messages on your phone. Your friends are asking you to check the news. You go online and see that all over the world, animals' behavior has become strange. You can see footage of a panda getting into someone's car and driving away. Another video captured several wolves standing in line at the supermarket. Chimpanzees are running out of a store with packs of books. In another video, several seals push a fisher out of his boat. Three waiters are sitting in the corner of a restaurant while lions are walking around them and roaring. One of these animals puts its paw on the menu. It looks like it wants to order some food. You don't notice a giraffe standing next to you. It bows its head and is also watching the video on your phone. You scream and run away. You approach your house and see Snowball. Your pet is surrounded by several stray cats and dogs. Looks like they're communicating with each other. They notice you and immediately run in different directions. You get into the house with Snowball. Cook your lunch and pour dry food into his bowl. Snowball refuses to eat those crunchy meatballs. He points his paw at your plate and jumps on a chair and waits for you to serve him a normal meal. It's all strange, but you give him your food and sit down next to the dog. After lunch, the dog runs into the living room and sits near the wardrobe. You open it. Snowball points at the second shelf with his nose. There's some blank paper there. You put one sheet on the floor. Snowball jumps onto the table and takes a pen with his mouth. The dog's holding it with his teeth and drawing something on the paper. After five minutes, you look at the drawing and realize that it's a crooked, incomprehensible inscription. And it says, from now, I understand everything. You look at the poodle and he nods. From this moment on, the lives of all people on the planet are changing. Your pet isn't the only one who has become sentient. All the mammals in the world are now as intelligent as humans. Dogs no longer walk the streets on leashes. Many pets run away from their owners and never come back. Others stay in houses and apartments, but only under certain conditions. Any pet has to eat the same food as their owner, sleep on a separate bed, choose TV shows to watch, and walk out when they want. Scientists around the world offer animals a chance to pass intelligence tests. Zebras pound out some famous melodies with their hooves. Gorillas are excellent at drawing and writing. Bulls draw geometric shapes on the sand with their horns. As soon as people realize the animals are smart, they decide to release all the mammals from captivity. Pigs, sheep, cows, and other farm animals escape from farms and pastures. They want to be free. Meat products are disappearing from all stores. Milk production slows down because not every cow wants to share it with people. Animals get freedom, but it isn't enough. They want to say something important but they can't because their vocal cords are not capable of it. To solve this problem, scientists create a collar that reads an animal's brain activity and turns their thoughts into words. Now mammals can speak with robot voices. A million wild and domestic animals come out of forests and the jungle all around the world. Reporters gather around them with cameras. A llama with a collar approaches the microphone. It declares the planet belongs not only to people, but to animals as well. From now on, people are prohibited from harming nature. If they violate the agreement, the animals will begin to take over the cities. A 500-page act is signed. The terms of the agreement are written in detail. Some of the animals move to the forests and jungles, but some mammals want to live in a comfortable urban environment. Several years pass. Animals and people are getting used to a new way of life. Every mammal living with humans now wears a speech collar. This allows them not only to communicate with humans, but also to become full-fledged society members. Now you can see wolves delivering mail on the streets. Antelopes work as track and field coaches. 
Orangutans work as librarians. One bat becomes a popular DJ and makes the best techno parties. People have learned a lot about animals thanks to the collars. It turns out that bulls are mannered, gallant gentlemen who don't like aggression and fights. Lions admit they love popularity. They want to be actors, writers, and musical artists. Bears are the laziest creatures on earth. It turns out they can't stand hunting and enjoy sleeping. That's why their winter hibernation lasts for months. Lemurs and jerboas are worried about the future of the planet. They work as politicians and hold the positions of CEOs in many large IT companies. But cats have surprised people most of all. It turns out they have always been intelligent. They just didn't tell us about it because they've been living well enough. Since ancient times, cats have been highly respected in many countries. They stay at houses all day, relax, and bask in the sun. People love them and give them food. It's a great life. When they got collars, they said they didn't want to change anything. Famous fashion houses hire animals as models. You can see lions, gorillas, elephants, lemurs, and koalas in stylish outfits on the covers of magazines. Whales and dolphins are mammals too. They've also become intelligent, but their way of life hasn't changed much. They still like to swim in the seas and oceans. One day, people decided to interview a blue whale, the biggest mammal in the world. The whale said that two things are important in this world, clean water and the ability to communicate at low frequencies with other whales. And be careful with animals that came here from another planet. Then the whale simply swam away instead of answering the question of what it just meant. Over time, people realize that animal intelligence develops faster than that of humans. They build unique exosuits that allow working with their paws like people. A roe deer gets in the exosuit and builds structures with the help of mechanical hands instead of hooves. Using modern technologies, some animals create comfortable houses in the forests. They also install video cameras on trees to monitor people who decide to chop some wood. Then the animals invent their own language. Now they can communicate with each other without collars, using gestures, sounds, and smells. 100 years later, a group of deer and sheep create their own company to conquer space. Mammals send the first rockets into space and colonize Mars with people. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your